so my name is Jason Lee, uh, and as David said, I'm the uh, CEO of Daily Pay, uh, which is an HR technology solution. Next slide. Uh, that enables you to uh, pay your employees daily. Um, very importantly, I'm super excited uh, to be alongside Mr. Jeff Gerks, uh, CHRO of G4S, uh, which is the world's largest integrated security services company. Uh, G4S is the third largest private employer in the world, uh, and so we're thrilled that he's here with us today. Um, so we're going to actually talk about a few things, and I actually took some uh, information from uh, the group here today. And so we're going to kind of zip through uh, this agenda here today. And actually, Jeff, I'm going to maybe do a little bit of a, uh, of a audible here, if you don't mind, because uh, I think we had a lot of people who I just spoke to uh, who have been asking me, at least, so uh, who is G4S? Who is Daily Pay? Um, and why are you guys sort of connected with one another? And so, Jeff, I may actually have you spend two minutes just kind of introducing G4S as a company. Um, because we at Daily Pay, one of the things that we've kind of learned is that uh, a lot of folks don't like hearing from us directly. Uh, they like really more hearing from uh, our clients and our partners. And so, Jeff, why don't I actually maybe have, and, and this is sort of audience demand here, uh, have you sort of spend maybe 30 seconds just kind of talking about uh, G4S as a company and how it is that we got connected, and then I'm going to flip back to kind of our presentation, if that's all right with yeah. you. Perfect. It's fine. Um, just to kind of provide a little bit of context here. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so you mentioned G4S, so we are our third largest employer in the world. Most people have never even heard of us before. If, you, if you've seen our logo, G4S, we get a lot of people that go, who's gas? Because <laughs> <laughs> it looks like that, G-A-S, it really looks like that. Uh, but we're, we're a very large business-to-business -business, uh, integrated security solutions provider. Um, globally, we have a large cash business, um, cash processing, cash um, transport, um, our largest businesses are in man guarding. Um, we also have some fairly large security technology companies. Um, we deal with secure integration, setting up cameras, hardware, things like that. And then we have a really, uh, really cool software development um, business called AMAG Technologies. I don't know if maybe some of your companies utilize our products and services. But the, the, the main emphasis for our organization is risk management, enterprise risk management, helping organizations try to figure out how to control their security risks and then provide solutions to help you do that, whether it's physical security, whether it's software, or whether it's some, some other form of technology. In the U.S., and that's how we ended up meeting with, uh, with Jason and Daily Pay, we have about uh, almost 50,000 employees in the U.S., um, spread out dispersed over about 100 markets. Um, as you can imagine, we have about 95% of our employees who are frontline employees, hourly paid employees, whether that's service technicians or, or security officers. And we are in the challenge that many of you are in, in today, which is the competition for talent, both how do we attract and keep people, but also, more importantly, how do we keep them happy once we have them? And so we, we found daily pay, and that's, that's Good introduction for you. So, uh, Jeff, um, you're employing 570,000 people across the world, which makes G4S or GAS uh, the, <laughs> the third largest private employer in the world. You know, when I work with folks like Jeff, and I appreciate, Jeff, you doing that, a little bit of a, a, a context framing for us here, I often think about Jeff as the CFO um, because the reality is without the employees, there is no business and there is no margin and there is no uh, revenue uh, to be had. And so I know that several of you are uh, certainly in that same position. So as I said, in the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to kind of talk about a couple of different topics. Um, number one, we'll talk about the labor uh, market challenges. David referenced last night that at the governing body dinner, uh, the main speaker sort of made a joke uh, and said, boy, I, I really can't uh, hear any more about this tight labor market. The good news is we're going to talk about that right here, and she's not here uh, right now. The second is um, we've done, you know, in our business, we spend an enormous amount of time uh, across a number of different demographics, geographies, um, all within the United States in terms of the actual employee base. We'll share with you a little bit of the insight that we've picked up in terms of what hourly employees or what large uh, swaths of workforces are thinking about and what they're actually needing from their employers. Um, we are uh, obviously sponsoring this event, so we'll give you a few seconds on just this whole daily pay benefit, what it is, 
Why is it that leading employers like Jeff uh, and G4S are actually using it? Um, and then importantly, I don't want to necessarily spend a ton of time on the actual ROI of something like this. What I'd rather spend time on is actually talking about the consistency of the ROI that we're seeing across all different industries. All of you represent a number of different industries, whether it be healthcare services, uh, uh, manufacturing, there's some B2B businesses uh, for folks I just met in the room prior to this session. And one of the fascinating things that I've picked up on is that the ROI across any industry has now harmonized and is fairly homogenous, which is telling us something about the actual efficacy of the benefit that's being offered. And then finally, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A uh, with Jeff as we wrap up. So uh, let me kind of zip through this because I think if you're in the HR business, you already know all of this. Um, but to kind of contextualize who we spend a lot of time with, and maybe if you're in one of these types of industries, you can kind of perk up a little bit. We've kind of found that there are three different types of industries, uh, excuse me, different types of business profiles where this topic seems to be resonating. Number one, if you are in a business where there are fixed price contracts, meaning if you are in a B2B business, which kind of offers or your model is that you've got fixed price contracts. Hey, we're a contact center and you know, our customers have now signed a contract, great news, and it's for the next three years. You know, if, if you kind of have that type of model. Secondly, if your business has labor as one of the primary cost of goods sold, and then finally, number three, if the quality or repeatability of your business is based on the quality of the actual service being provided. This is a very complicated way of saying, if labor is a primary input into your business model, then this talk is probably for you. Um, I think everyone knows that, boy, oh boy, it is super hard to hire people because the unemployment rate is at an all-time low and the employment cost index has also just marginally moved over the last year or so. But what does this actually mean for employees? The traditional way of thinking about the world is that low unemployment, in theory, should mean higher wages. It's just kind of basic supply and demand. If it's hard to hire people, and if they are the thing that is in demand, uh, and there is very low supply, well, one ought to pay more for that. And so wages should go up. The paradox, however, of the Trump economy in terms of what we're seeing today is that that's actually not occurring. Unemployment is at an all-time low, but price inflation, and so consequently wage inflation, is also at an all-time low. And so that's a very complicated way of saying, we can't hire people, but boy, it's really hard to pay them more to hire them because it's very difficult for us to raise prices on our consumers or on our end B2B customers. And so that's sort of the challenge that exists right now in the labor market. A few weeks ago, uh, and may maybe some of you were there, um, I'm actually not a big conference speaker, but just by coincidence, a few weeks ago, I was out in Chicago um, talking at uh, the Connect conference, which is actually for CHROs and for CFOs. So really sort of getting at the angle of how does labor impact the actual CFOs um, and, and the bottom line of the actual business. And one of the things that um, we talked a lot about was how best in class employers today are dealing with this labor crunch. And here I was at the first floor of this building or this, this hotel conference center speaking on this topic and I heard a bunch of rumbling upstairs, a bunch of noise and distraction from the second floor of this conference center. So sure enough, I went upstairs to figure out what was going on. And interestingly, Amazon was in that building doing a big recruiting event. So I kind of stopped our session and just said, everyone just go upstairs because that is, and that's all you need to see. Amazon had just made the announcement that they were raising wages to $15 an hour, and they're kind of blatantly and shamelessly recruiting. This was in Chicago. You know, I think like 20,000 drivers and warehouse workers, all at $15 an hour, um, you know, in the same hotel that here we are talking about the perils and the, 
the, the troubles and the, and, and the dangers and, uh, of the labor market that we're in. And I think this was just a stark reminder, I think, at least to me, as well as everyone in the room, that this competition is real. At the time, Amazon employed about a half a million people in the United States, and now they're actually going to basically double that number um, as they continue to grow the physical delivery aspects of their business. Not everyone can afford to pay what Amazon pays, of course. You know, Amazon's out there paying $15 an hour. For those of you who don't follow that company, Amazon's in a very unique and very favorable position as it relates to their business. They are one of the very, very few employers in the entire world who employs that many people, 400,000 people or so, but they can afford to pay high wages because their company is not valued on margin. It's valued on growth. There are very few companies in the world, and Jeff can attest to this, when you employ a half a million people, it's hard to be talked about as a growth company. But yet Amazon has figured out some way to do that, and consequently, they can pay people more. Now, what does that all mean for us? It means that's the labor force, and those are the labor dynamics that we are actually competing with. At that conference, I was speaking alongside a CHRO of a bit of a smaller company than G4S. It was um, about a 5,000 person hotel chain um, who was also a good friend, uh, who's become a good friend of mine, uh, the CHRO of 21C Museum and Hotels. And one of the things that he was sharing with me and that he shared with the audience there was, hey, we've got locations in Louisville, uh, in Raleigh, in all these different sort of places. And guess what? The reason why we started offering unique benefits like a daily pay and some other benefits is because actually we are competing. We are literally competing with Amazon for that labor force, you know, because they're out there sort of in, you know, building fulfillment centers across the country. The next observation I have, and um, if, if I could make a, 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 an HR bingo board for things that we are all very, very tired of hearing about in HR, it would be, uh, tight labor market, AI, and probably the third is millennials and Gen Z with respect to the millennials and Gen Z who are in this room. M me not, I am not, I'm certainly not one. Um, but I think we're all sort of, we all kind of heard about this, but it is the truth, which is millennials and Gen Z will make up 75% of the workforce, and they are clearly different. The needs that they have and the way they think about the world is profoundly and fundamentally different than the way probably the majority of us think about uh, the world. Um, Importantly, uh, there are different priorities that now exist. It's not just about technology, um, but it's fundamentally different. I'd, I'd point you to uh, the, the, the column over here, which is millennials are in a world where they are facing a lot more of a higher cost of living. Money is an issue, and due to whether it be student loan debt or just the fact that prices have gone up, uh, I was speaking with my younger sister this weekend um, who uh, barely has uh, a, a, a job, and you know her comment to me was, her comment to me was, boy, I really don't want to look at my Uber bill, and I'm sort of thinking, well, why? why? <laughs> you know, you live in New York City. Why? Why do you even have a uh, an Uber bill? You could take the subway, but the mentality has clearly changed in terms of what is discretionary, and what is staple uh, expenses when it comes to the millennial generation, and so that's a very long way of saying. Um, they have different pressures and fundamentally a different mindset as they think about money, pay, expenses, lifestyle. And so um, to wrap up this section, there are really three things that we are observing in the labor market. Number one, unemployment makes it very, very difficult to hire folks right now. People have their choice of job. Secondly, and I think everyone in this room if you employ hourly workers have probably been there, a 50 cent raise across the street, that's good enough reason to walk uh, from your current position simply because wage inflation is so low. And so a 50 cent increase off of a $10 base is a pretty significant number. That's a number that we can't afford to do in our businesses, but certainly if someone else is offering, that employee may, may walk. And then finally, three fourths of the workforce thinks about work thinks about compensation, thinks about what's important to them in a very different way than how all of us think about things. Um, so 
the uh, polling question, um, sorry, have we already polled this question? No, this is when you guys. Oh, okay. So I was going to say that uh, the, the results look like they are done already. Um, well, whoever that was, I appreciate your early, uh, your, uh, that's definitely a over, I want to know who that person is. <laughs> um, uh, very overachieving, eager person. Um, but have you ever raised wages in the last year to compete in this competitive labor market? Now, I want to specify, I don't mean just raising wages as a normal thing to compete, or excuse me, to keep up with maybe some level of inflation. I'm saying, have you gone out? to your CFO or to your CEO, or if you are a CFO or CEO in the room, have you made the decision to actually use this as a tool to compete for labor? And so we'll give it one second here to, um, to queue up if you all, um, if you all want to uh, get your votes in. OK, great. Well, OK, so roughly, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. Roughly, wow, OK, so 62% uh, of you have. Um, about a third of you have not. Uh, and about 7% uh, got distracted with Candy Crush when I asked that question. <laughs> so uh, about 2 thirds of you have. Now, what I find fascinating about this is all of you are still here in this session trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with this labor crunch? So two-thirds of you have already tried raising wages as the way to recruit and retain more people. But yet, I would challenge you, and I don't know every specific situation, of course, but I would maybe you're just writing a wrong, or it was just getting back up to par, or whatever the situation might be. But I think directionally, one provocative thought to think about is two-thirds of us, or more than two-thirds of us, have tried this as a tactic, but it may still not be working. It may not be enough. We may be bumping up against the limit of the amount of wages that we can offer, just given the fundamental dynamics uh, around our core businesses. Um, I'm going to spend uh, like three minutes or so just maybe giving you some perspective in terms of what we learned uh, about who your employees are. Now, we don't profess to know every single person or every type of person in the demographic, of course, um, within uh, your workforce. But you know, one of the things that's been very eye-opening to me as we've kind of operated this business is the employee needs in, in this particular type of demographic, perhaps the hourly workforce, they're actually quite simple. Oftentimes, I feel like in HR, if I, if I may say, we have a tendency, perhaps, to overcomplicate the actual fundamental need that the employee has. The employer-employee compact is really based on some very simple things. Pay, less stress, ease at work, and flexibility. The compact is very straightforward. And whilst there are many ways to address each of these needs, I think it's important for us to really isolate, well, why is someone? deciding to fill out that application and work here, well, because they have very basic needs they need to fill. And if you can identify that, and, and if, even if you disagree, as purely an academic matter, just kind of go with me, that that is in fact what our employees are asking for, it helps us think about and see the actual benefits package in a very different light. As we've kind of worked with different large employers across the US, um, what we've been able to figure out is that uh, you know, the, the needs of the employees, whilst they are very simple, they kind of express themselves in very different ways based on who the actual employee may be. And so for us as a business, you know, we try to put some personas kind of and, and some faces behind the names so we can start thinking about, well, who are, you know, who is actually in the workforce? Who are the people that we're trying to satisfy? All of you, I'm sure, do a very similar exercise within your current organization. Now, while each of these traditional benefits may meet the needs of a Sasha, a Lara, a Mark, or a Pete in some capacity, there is really just one unifying trend 
across all of these employees. And that is the need for financial flexibility, which then leads to financial flexibility, which then leads to engagement, which then ultimately leads to that person staying at, at the place of employment. And so that's kind of the theory here behind what it is that we've figured out, which is the needs may mask themselves in different personas, in different personalities, in different life situations. But to be very blunt, the need is universal, which is people just want to be able to pay their bills on time and be responsible adults um, and responsible uh, contributors to their family. And, and that's really the, the, the thing they're looking for in the employer-employee compact. And so with that said, as backdrop, I'm going to spend the next kind of three or four minutes here talking about what we do as a living, uh, for a living rather, which is this thing called a daily pay benefit and how this fits in the backdrop of what we've just discussed. Very quick polling question, however, um, which is if you've kind of come to this session, I kind of want to see, have you ever heard of a daily pay benefit before uh, this session or before this conference? So uh, just give us a sense. Great, um, uh, as to whether or not you've heard about this as a, um, as a benefit. OK, fantastic. OK, great. So uh, I think that puts us into context. And actually, that will allow me maybe to spend uh, an extra minute or so on just explaining, just so I have a good sense of uh, the knowledge in the room, what a daily pay benefit is. Um, and, and then we can kind of walk through the applicability of it and then get to Jeff. So um, about three years ago or so, uh, this new benefits category started to emerge, uh, which is what we call a daily pay benefit. We started the, the, the benefit in the marketplace. and. To, to get us kind of in the right geography here, um, it is like any other benefit. And what I mean by that is, like any other benefit, the idea here is can we improve and frankly change employee engagement and retention? Like any other benefit, it typically can be employee or employer paid. For what it's worth in our business, it's mostly employee paid. Um, you know, it does not require any special funding by the employer. And most importantly, like any other benefit, healthcare um, or any other type of insurance, it's used when you need it. So employees basically um, sort of have it on standby, and they use it when they need it in the same way that none of us, or maybe most of us, don't just go to the doctor when we feel like it. We go when we have a problem. Uh, in the same way, people will access this benefit on purely a needs-based benefit. Um, in 2017, we estimate that roughly 5% of the workforce started to be paid daily. And I'll talk a little bit about what exactly that means. Uh, but about 5% of the workforce had this available kind of last year. Um, and you can kind of see some of the employers um, across the country who are starting to adopt this as a way to really meet deeply the fundamental needs of their employees and to change their behavior. Um, you fast forward to where we are this year as an example. Uh, you know, companies like an ADP or a Ceridian, you know, they are now offering this to their payroll customers uh, through, um, through companies like ourselves. Um, and so now all of a sudden that number has kind of jumped to one in six Americans when you add up uh, the number of Americans who are paid even ju just by these two payroll companies alone. Now one in six Americans have the ability through their employer to access the benefit through their payroll outsourcing firm. Um, uh, many of you may work with payroll uh, partners or perhaps payroll reports through you. Um, and so uh, let me maybe uh, pause here and just kind of contextualize what we mean by a daily pay benefit. The concept here is the following. We just spent about 20 minutes talking about how difficult the labor market is how challenging life is for a lot of the employees. And so the concept is if the employee can access her pay on her timing, well, then she can pay that bill on time. She can avoid the $30 late fee. She can actually change her life. And consequently, as she finds that benefit 
to be realized through her place of employment, she stays longer. So that's kind of how the, the, the science works around how the benefit actually changes employee behavior. However, all of you don't need you know, any of this um, or, or someone like me or a company like ours to actually create this effect at your own place of employment. Meaning, the concept here is if the employee got paid daily, if they could access their funds when they want, well, that would actually result in this behavioral change. And so to kind of level set, all of you can do this on your own. If your payroll team wanted to run payroll daily, well, what would that mean? All employees would get all of their pay every day. The challenge, of course, with doing this is all of the bad stuff, which is, well, that would mean the company has to actually run payroll every day. They have to pay the money every day. They have to withhold every day. They've got to do the deductions every day. And they have to figure out all the hours and confirm kind of what people worked every day. And so again, if you have payroll as a, part, a business partner or perhaps work uh, flowing into you from a departmental standpoint, I think you can probably relate to, hey, this is a great concept. Let's pay people daily. But it then comes with a bunch of natural uh, limitations, which is the practicality of that. And so to contextualize what we mean by a daily pay benefit, it's really the right side, which is using a service where you get the benefit of all of your employees being able to access their pay when they want, but none of the bad stuff, which is you don't have to fund the payroll yourself, you don't have to run it yourself, you don't have to withhold. All of that work is being outsourced including all the funding um, to a company like ours. So just to kind of contextualize, it's all of the good stuff of running payroll daily without any of the bad stuff. And that's really the concept that we're trying to get across as it relates to a daily pay benefit. Um, uh, the experience for the employee is very straightforward. That might look like something that you've seen before, um, which is an ATM machine. And that is exactly the concept. In an ATM machine, like the one downstairs in this lobby, you press a few buttons, and you see how much money is in your bank account. And you say, gosh, I need $100 uh, in cash. So you press a few buttons, and the machine spits out 100 The purpose of that machine is to move money from your account into your hands. You never pay it back. A week from now, you're not going to come here and try to stick the $100 back in the machine. No, because it's your money. It's your money that's been given to you. And so in the same way, when an employee works at your company, they earn a balance. And that balance gets remitted on payday. But it is their money. They just haven't received it yet. And so what the technology solution provides is an ability for someone to see what their balance is during the actual pay period, i.e., this person has worked $250. But lo and behold, my goodness, they've got a bill coming due tonight. And they have no money. And the only alternative is to pay the bill late and to incur a $30 late fee, or worse, overdraft their own bank account and pay a $50 overdraft fee. They tap a button as they would on, uh, as they would, excuse me, with a normal, with a, a traditional ATM machine. They tap it for $80. They get a quick financial tip. And all of a sudden, in about a millisecond, that $80 shows up in their own bank account or their own payroll card or however they're currently getting paid. They then take that money, they pay their bill on time, and that's how the service actually works. It's her money. She's already earned it. There's nothing ever to pay back. In the same way that you would never take your money and try to stick it back into the ATM machine because it is your money, in the same way this person doesn't have to ever pay anything back because it already is her money. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I probably should have. Th uh, thanks for that. Um, the, the, for simplicity, we've just shown a nice picture here. But that $250 is the net, net amount. And there's some sausage, which I'm happy to talk about later, because um, I love sausage and sausage making. Um, I can tell you about how we do all those calculations, but, but ostensibly uh, the amount that they're seeing is the net amount that they're meant to receive on payday. 
um, garnishments, all of that taken out. For the operator standpoint, of course, um, one of the elegant things about offering a benefit like this um, is that there's no change to the existing payroll system. So the technology fits like a glove on top of whatever existing HRMS or payroll system currently exists within the company, uh, obviously fully compliant. Um, and boy, I, I must have taken this from the handbook of vendors, close to zero effort by the employer. Um, and so there is, uh, the, the way that uh, at least our model works is there is no cost for the employer. Uh, there's just a transactional fee that gets charged only when the employee takes a transfer. We charge three bucks uh, to take that transfer so they receive it instantly. Uh, and so the employee mindset is the following. My goodness, I've got a bill due. I'm about to be evicted. I can pay this bill late and incur $30 or a $50 fee, or I can access the money I already earned and pay a $3 fee, and I reduce my cost of capital by 90 to 95%, and I get to stay in the house. And so that's really the concept that we're trying to get across, in large part because the payroll system itself, if anyone has run payroll or knows about payroll, it is, it is a great, good, 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 that probably sums it up. It is very immobile and very kludgy to actually try to operate um, this type of benefit. Um, now let me get to the good stuff. What are we seeing in our operators' businesses? The first thing that we're seeing is a massive reduction in turnover. Massive. I'm going to get to why this is happening, but the punchline is, on average, it's a 41% reduction in turnover for daily pay users. And that is an astounding number. I wish it weren't so big, so it would seem more credible. But I can tell you, that is the number. That it, is, it is purely that. So the guys who would have quit in three months now stay for five months. Those who would have quit in six months now stay for nine months. And so over the course of a year, that's a whole fewer number of hires, W-2s, onboarding, offboarding, and that's where the savings comes from for the company. Secondly, obviously folks are more motivated to come to work. But third, when others hear about the benefit, that's being offered, they want to come work for that company. And so our practitioners are telling us there's a 52% increase in the number of applicants for my open positions, or said differently, if you take the inverse mathematically of that number, they're basically filling the positions twice as fast as it normally would have taken. From the employee standpoint, when we survey the users, this is what it's being used for. 86% of employees say, gosh, I can now actually live as an adult. I can pay my bills on time. The average employee pays about $1,300 a year in late fees. All of a sudden, we put that money back in their pocket because now they don't have to pay the bill late. It's not that they don't have enough money. It's that they don't have the right amount of money at the right time. There's a big difference. It's not that they don't make enough, it's that they don't have the money at the right time because Verizon only charges on the 16th. Rent is only due on the 30th. Con the utility bill is always due on the 12th. And so you can't always get that right as it relates to your pay schedule. One in five at the bottom of this said, hey, you know what? I used to finance my life through a payday loan, and now I don't have to. This is an astounding number for two reasons. Number one, one in five people were financing their life through a payday loan, and now they don't have to. But more importantly for you, the employers, what does this mean? I'm most proud of the top and the bottom statistic here, which is we th think a lot about what does this mean for the employer, the employer's value proposition, the employer's brand ethos. What are you offering to the employees in this labor market more than two-thirds have said, guess what? My ENPS, my employee ranking of my employer, has actually shot up meaningfully because of the daily pay benefit. And 100% of people say, I'm actually going to tell my friends about this company now because my friend should really work here. 100% of people are saying, I'd recommend my loved ones to come work 
at this company. I'm going to end here and then kind of turn it over to our talk here with Jeff with just to give you a real life example of what this means. And I'm going to just read to you, obviously at, uh, in our customer service area, we get letters upon letters upon notes uh, around what this actually means for folks. And so let me maybe read this to you from a contact center, I guess in Missouri is where um, this big contact center is. It, when they rolled out the daily pay program to us, I shrugged it off, regarded it as something that I'd never use again. After we exited the meeting about how to use daily pay, I never really thought about it again. Now fast forward three days later, I'm completely broke. By the way, just as a side note, <laughs> you know, our employees think about life on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, here they are, oh, I'll never use this. Three days later, I'm broke. I, I don't know what happened in that three-day period, but people live for that moment. I owed $100 in rent that day and was relying on overdraft on my bank account. I tried to use my debit card to pull out $100 for a money order, but was denied. Concerned, I called the bank and was told my overdraft was turned off by the system and that there was nothing they could do. Panicked, now I drove towards the bank. My mind racing, what could I do to save my situation? And then I remembered daily pay. Could this in fact work? As I waited in line at the bank, I created the account. Setting one up takes less than five minutes. And it showed me I have $122 net to use. I was unsure if it would work as quick as it needed to and was skeptical as my banker and I sat down to try the instant transfer option. In literal seconds, my banker exclaimed, it's there. He was so impressed that he asked for the information on daily pay so he could propose it to his boss for their company to use. I was so relieved. I went home to the apartment complex to pay my rent. So the things that I take away from this are this person is not leaving this company, not for a very long time, because something has changed. The employer-employee compact has been fundamentally deepened because she had a need. She had a real need that was not being met by the way the current structure is set up. And th there's no fault of a bi-weekly or semi-monthly or whatever pay schedule or a weekly pay schedule. It's just the way life is. And so at, consequently, with a benefit like this, now this person doesn't have to sleep in the car that weekend. You can sure believe that she's going to be staying at that employer a little bit longer than what she normally would have. It's about meeting the true need that the employee has. They have this need. And it's important to acknowledge that as you think about what types of benefits would be most applicable. So with that, I'm going to ask Jeff to kind of come up. Jeff, I know we, we did your intro um, part already um, about the actual business. And so maybe I'll just jump um, into Q&A if that's sure. all right with you. And maybe for the sake of time, we can reduce the number of Q&A here. So sure. The audience has some time. To yeah. Um, so um, Jeff, maybe I can start with the following, which is you are in the human capital business, given that you're, you know, I'm sure buildings, in fact, our building uses G4S uh, as well, our corporate office. Um, um, but tell us a little bit about what are the challenges um, that you're facing. We know it's retention, recruiting, all of that, but specifically for G4S's business, how is that impacting your all's business? Yeah, so in, uh, in I'll, I'll keep this to the U.S. business mm -hmm. right now, and our manned guarding, our security business, which is our largest business in the U.S. We have about 45,000 employees across the U.S. And we, in G4S, in the manned guarding business, we work on contracts with customers. So what does that mean? It means that we sign a contract, they're typically three years long. They typically have a specific wage for a specific job that's inside of that contract. And at what we find ourselves in more today than any time previously is that the wage compression that we see now against our margin is really, really challenging for our business. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? We have many, many of our contracts that are in the $10 to $13 an hour range for our security officers. You see what Amazon's doing at $15 an hour. You see what's happened in many other markets across the US. And we have two options in that situation. One is go to the customer and say, hey, Mr. Customer, would you please give us some more money on the thing that we agreed that we would do for you? And that works often, right? For that right? three year. It's, very, it's a very challenging <laughs> conversation. 
it's a very challenging conversation because our customers are experiencing the same thing, right. but they have the same challenges. So I'm going to give you some of the hard-earned money that I'm trying to figure out how to make <laughs> on my own. So it's a very, very challenging thing to do. Um, the second thing we can do is go ahead and decide to, wait, to increase wages for those specific jobs within those markets where we need because our number one objective is to service that contract the way we committed we were going to do it, with a quality service, with, a, with meeting the SLAs and meeting the customer's expectations. And those customers' expectations are written specifically into those contracts. You will do these things these many times at this level of performance. And that is paramount to us. So what do we do? We have to give up some of our margin in order to get wages where we need them in order to meet this, the qualifications that we committed to as an organization to our customers. Because that is ultimately the most important thing for us. So once we do that, what does that mean to our organization? We fall into that that all three of those buckets actually that you put up before, but when your labor is such a big co cost of goods for us, we have to figure out what else are we going to do to try to control our costs. Well, this labor market is also doing one other thing to us. It's increasing our turnover pretty significantly. And because our turnover has gone up, we were traditionally in the 40% turnover range. We're running about 73% annual turnover right now. Over the last 18 months, it's gone that high. Many of you probably have experienced the same thing with your frontline employees. Um, but in addition to that, our cost associated with going to recruit and to hire people outside of the need to do it because we have more people we have to do it now, but I'm talking about just the status, the static um, money that we have to spend is up 43% also because we have to deploy new ways and new things. We, have, we do have artificial intelligence, which we brought to, to bear. We're spending more money with Indeed than we ever have before. I mean, you, you know, I'm probably singing the same song you guys are all experiencing. So that's the situation that we find ourselves in in the organization, which means you have to figure out other ways to extract cost. So we've done that inside of G4S for the last 18 months, is figure out other ways to extract cost so we can still produce the profit that's expected of our shareholders. Jeff, give us a little bit of a sense, and maybe we'll um, also take some questions from the audience, but give us a sense, you know, here you are, member of the management team. Um, what was the conversation like with your CEO, CFO, hey, I think we have this way, we got this crazy idea. Um, g give us a sense of kind of their receptivity to your work that you kind of figured out here. So we, we've pushed a whole bunch of buttons on the retention strategy, as you can imagine. I'm sure you, many of you are doing the same things, trying all kinds of different things. We went back, we do our bi biannual survey every year to our employees across all, almost 600,000 employees across the, the globe. And we went back and we dug into the the meat of that survey. And inside of that survey in the US, we found that there were a lot of people that were not only talking about wanting to make more money, but that they wished they had ways to get to that money in it more frequently than we were paying them. Most of our employees are paid on a bi-weekly basis. And that was, was sort of an interesting um, comment that we had never really dug out of the comments before. And so we started to explore, is there actually a way to do that? Because in our world, people leave our organization to go make 50 cents an hour more somewhere else. So if I'm paying you bi-weekly and I'm going somewhere else that's paying bi-weekly, there's really just one pay cycle that they have to deal with. So it's not, it's not really an encumbrance for somebody to decide to leave for 50 cents more an hour. So anyway, so <clears throat> the conversations went something like this, which is if we can figure out a way to pay employees daily, it'll be a differentiator in the marketplace against our competitors. We should have an ability to make it much more attractive for employees to stay with us if I can know I can get paid tomorrow the money that I earned yesterday, rather than having to wait three or four weeks if I decide to change, that's a meaningful difference now. And so the other part of the conversation that we had was, how can we make this happen? So we went to our traditional ADP, which is our, our payroll processor in the US, and they had no solution for us. We could do the same thing that you put up on the board, I was laughing. Because they said, you can process payroll every day if you want, but there's going to be this fee and that fee, and our payroll department said, hell no, <laughs> no, don't even go there. So we started to explore some other um, smaller organizations of which Daily Pay was one of the three of them that we ended up exploring. And we ended up meeting with uh, all of them. We ended up selecting uh, Daily Pay, mostly for some of the reasons that you put up there, but it doesn't touch our cash. That's a big differentiator between what some of the other competitors are doing. So we run our payroll just like oh, we always have. But now employees can access their money because it's, it's tapped into our time system. So the time system creates a bank. Every day they get a feed, it creates a bank, it shows up on their phones just like they showed and employees use it. It's amazing. We rolled it out. We're four months in now to the rollout. I think we're only about a month. Yeah, four months in to starting. We're, oh, yeah. We're, we're six yeah. weeks into the full rollout. That's right. And we have already had 21% adoption. <laughs> it's amazing. 21% of our 45,000 employees have adopted daily pay. 
that shows you that we tapped into something that is really going to be meaningful. The other thing, and I haven't shared this with any of you, you all yet, but I did, did some, had some team do some analysis on the turnover, early mm -hmm. turnover numbers. And I, I got rid of the first month, but the, the, next, the, the first two months of the full rollout for eight, the eight pilot locations, we've seen a 41% reduction. No, you have. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Your number was 41%. I saw it. It's actually 41.6. So if you want that's to say it's 42, that's, that's right. amazing. <laughs> it's 42. Well, there we go. The consistency of the experience. That's amazing. Okay, they're about to, they're about to so, kick us out here. But anyway, um, I think, what's that? So I think the, the folks would like us to, to end, but maybe we can do the following, which is have folks come up, because I think we can sure. try to wrap it up and um, uh, maybe folks can, if they have questions, we can just kind of answer them here. Yeah, I think they're kicking us out here.